Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to this solemn ceremony marking the change of command for Joint Force Command Norfolk, United States Second Fleet, and the combined joint operations from the sea, Center of Excellence, during which Vice Admiral Daniel Dwyer will be relieved by Vice Admiral Douglas Perry. Today's ceremony marks the second change of command for both Joint Force Command Norfolk, NATO's only operational command in North America, and the reestablished United States Second Fleet. This ceremony is unique in that it will include the transfer of responsibility and authority for two distinct but interrelated commands. Joint Force Command Norfolk, aligned to NATO, and United States Second Fleet, aligned to United States Fleet Forces Command. Additionally, it will mark the change in directorship for NATO's Combined Joint Operations from the Sea Center of Excellence. All three headquarters share a common leader in command and a common mission to deter an aggression in the Atlantic and Arctic, and if necessary, prevail over any threat to peace and stability against the United States, our allies, and partners. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the United States National Anthem, the NATO Hymn, and Invocation. Vice Admiral, United States Navy, arriving. Joint Force Command Norfolk, United States Second Fleet, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence, arriving. Fleet forces arriving. Supreme Allied Commander Europe arriving.
Navy arriving. Color Guard, present the colors. Guard, retire the colors. Bosun, post the side boys. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Fleet Chaplain Captain Amadick will now deliver the invocation. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to conduct a time-honored change of command ceremony. This morning, we honor Vice Admiral Dwyer's leadership and accomplishments at Second Fleet and Joint Force Command Norfolk. We are grateful for his steadfast guidance during more than two years of rapid growth and change at both commands. It really has been a remarkable time. We also ask your strengthening hand upon Vice Admiral Perry as he takes the helm of our fleet. Bless our ceremony as we celebrate past accomplishments and prepare to face and overcome future challenges. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Military guests may remove their covers. Vice Admiral Daniel Dwyer, Commander, Joint Force Command Norfolk, Commander, United States Second Fleet, Director, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Outstanding. What a great Navy and NATO day. This ceremony could not have happened here today on this magnificent ship without the effort of so many. First, to Captain Frosty Snowden, the commanding officer of USS Harry S. Truman, thank you to the entire crew for turning out and providing such an awesome venue, one of our nation's 11 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers that is a symbol of the U.S.'s commitment to our allies from the NATO alliance. And you wouldn't know it by looking at this ship, but she had just completed major overhaul maintenance and just prior to the holidays was returned here to Naval Station Norfolk and Captain Snowden took command. I tell you, as this, this ship prepares for her deployment, I mean, by the looks of her right now, she's ready to go today. But I know Captain Snowden leads a great team, and we're certainly appreciative of hosting us here on Harry S. Truman. I'd also like to thank Commander O'Brien, the Truman's intelligence officer, who served as a valuable liaison to my staff to ensure every detail and request was met. Also, thanks to the Truman Color Guard, who so proudly and professionally presented our nations, our navies, and the NATO standard. And a ceremony is so much more richer with a band. And so thank you to the U.S. Fleet Forces band led by Ensign McGann, always so professional, and you all make us proud with your performance. I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests. Joining Vice Admiral Perry and me on stage is the 78th Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Carlos Del Toro. Supreme Allied Commander Europe and Commander U.S. European Command General Christopher Cavoli. And Commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command Admiral Darrell Cottle. Distinguished guests in the audience are include, and please hold your, your, your applause, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Navy for Financial Management and Comptroller, the Honorable Russell Rombaugh, Chair of the NATO Military Committee, Admiral Rob Bauer of the Royal Netherlands Navy, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, General Chris Badia of the German Air Force, Chief of Staff of Allied Command Transformation, Vice Admiral Guy Robinson of the Royal Navy, Deputy Commander Joint Force Command Naples, Lieutenant General Steve Kelsey of the Canadian Army, Deputy Commander, Joint Force Command Bronson, Lieutenant General Luis Lanchares of the Spanish Army, Deputy Commander Lancom, Lieutenant General Zanelli of the Italian Army, Deputy Commander NATO Aircom, Air Vice Marshal Johnny Stringer of the Royal Air Force, 
Deputy Commander Marcom, Vice Admiral Martel of the French Navy, Commander U.S. Naval Information Forces, Vice Admiral Kelly Oshbach, Commander U.S. Marine Forces Command, Lieutenant General Brian Cavanaugh, Commander U.S. Submarine Forces, Vice Admiral Rob Goucher, Commander U.S. Coast Guard Atlantic Area Commander, Vice Admiral Kevin Lundy, Chief of Staff for the Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Christopher Diaz, Executive Director of U.S. Fleet Forces Command, Mr. Matt Schwartz, Representing Senator Mark Warner's office, Mr. Gene Garland, Mayor Dyer from the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach Councilman Berlucci and Schulman, Suffolk Councilmember Fawcett and Recker, Norfolk City Manager Patrick Roberts, Chairman of the Hampton Roads Navy League, Lou Shager, and there are numerous retired flag and general officers joining us here today. Admiral Jamie Fogo, former commander of Joint Force Command Naples and U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Africa, and now the Dean for the Center of Maritime Strategy. And Vice Admirals Bullet Miller, Kenny Weitzel, Bill Mers, Joe Malloy, Joe Tofalo, and Scott Van Buskirk and all fellow flag and general officers from both the U.S. and NATO, as well as all senior enlisted fleet and fort master chiefs and command sergeant majors, and the men and women of Joint Force Command Norfolk, the U.S. Second Fleet, and the Combined Joint Operations Center of Excellence, and the family of the Dwyers and the Perrys. <laughs> Woo! However, I would be remiss if I didn't honor one officer who could not be with us today. Two weeks ago, on December 30th, Rear Admiral Brian Davies, after a long and valiant struggle, was taken from us far too soon. Brian was a career submarine officer who, during my first two years in command of Second Fleet, served as a commander of Submarine Group 2 and concurrently as the Second Fleet's deputy commander. There was no finer officer, no more dedicated officer, and no more better friend than Brian Davies. His heroic example will guide each of us as we move forward, for none did it better than Brian. All who knew Brian knew that he loved being a submarine officer and serving as the deputy commander of the Second Fleet. And I know he is here with us now, smiling with intense pride of the accomplishments of every one of his shipmates. With us here today is Brian's lovely bride, Casey. Casey, thank you for everything you did to enable Brian's greatness. You and Caitlin were his greatest source of pride and you allowed him to live out his dream to the benefit of our great Navy and our great nation. Christina, Doug, Joanne, and I are so grateful that you are here to share today with us, for we love you and Brian so much. So again, welcome to you all. Now, it is my tremendous honor to introduce the first of our two guest speakers, the 78th Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Carlos Del Toro. Secretary Del Toro needs no introduction for anyone in uniform. He's a sailor's sailor, an ardent supporter of every sailor in uniform and their families. I encourage you to read his bio in your programs, and if you have not already, you will find the in-person manifestation of the American dream. Immigrating from Cuba in 1962, setting, settling and growing up in New York City, receiving an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy, and as a 1993 graduate, would go on to a successful Navy career as a surface warfare officer, where he would ultimately rise to command the Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyer USS Bulkley. From military uniform to C-suite, 
he found a successful company where he would continue to support the U.S. Navy across multiple warfare domains. Appointed by President Biden and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in August 2021, Secretary Del Toro has led the Navy on many fronts with zeal and passion. As Navy Secretary, he has been a staunch advocate for fleet modernization, fleet readiness, and fleet family readiness, which you all can see in the living example here today. Secretary Del Toro also knows the importance of a strong NATO alliance and has backed this up with overwhelming U.S. Navy support to Joint Force Command Norfolk. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Carlos Del Toro, the 78th Secretary of the Navy. Good morning, everyone. If it seems like I'm shouting, it's because I actually spent uh, quite a bit of time on an uh, aircraft carrier, the USS America, as its main propulsion assistant. And I could tell that the ventilation systems haven't changed much since I served on one. Before I actually begin my formal comments, allow me to share with you for a brief moment on how I spent my day yesterday. I uh, woke up at around 5.30. I woke up my wife at 5.45 and I turned to her and said, honey, I feel the urge to speak to the brigade of midshipmen today. We were actually going to do a change of command for what is now the first female superintendent of our Naval Academy in the 178 years of the history of our academy. Yvette Davids, Vice Admiral Yvette Davids, took the reins from another great surface warrior like her, Vice, uh, soon to be Vice Admiral Fred Kacher, who will be going out to Seventh Fleet. Yes, thank God this national nightmare is over, and we can now promote all these great warriors that deserve to be promoted. So I joined the midshipmen for lunch before the formal ceremony. And I'll share with them what I share, I'll share with you what I shared with them. How proud I am to be the 78th Secretary of the Navy. How thankful I am to the President and to the American people for the privilege of serving our United States sailors and Marines and civilians who serve in the Department of the Navy. And I shared with them how proud I was yesterday as well as today as well as for the rest of my tour as Secretary of the Navy, of the job that our United States Navy has accomplished overseas. Harry S. Truman, give him hell. We gave him hell last night. And I reminded them of how important it is for them to strive to be the very best that they can be, not to be the number one graduate or at the top of the very class, but to be the very best that they could be, so that they can go on into our United States Navy and into our United States Marine Corps and lead the men and women that I'm proud to lead as well, and to be the best that they can be, so that they can then prove the professionalism that has been demonstrated just this past week, when on Tuesday we fought back multiple UAVs that was thrown at the fleet not just our United States ships, but our allies as well. And the innocent merchant ships that are sailing through the Red Sea, providing trade and uh, across the entire globe, as well as three anti-ship cruise missiles that were launched as well. And yesterday, of course, I knew what was coming, and I'm extremely proud of our fleet again for the work that they've done. But that just doesn't happen. It actually takes years, decades, to train those sailors and Marines to be the professionals that they are. It takes decades on the part of so many across the United States Navy, the Marine Corps, and our allies and partners, all of us working together as one, to build the capabilities that we have today as allies and partners to be interoperable, to be interchangeable. 
And that is why we've been able to do just yesterday what we needed to do. And I hope that that is sufficient to deter the Houthis and Iran from continuing their behavior into the future so that we can then get back to the business of what we care about most, which is actually deterring aggression and preserving the peace globally for all nations to be able to mutually benefit from peace. So I thank each and every one of you coming here today to recognize these two great warriors and all the other great warriors including Admiral Cavoli, his leadership in UCOM has been nothing but extraordinary. And recognize that they, true are, they truly are the leaders of those men and women out there that are deployed globally, a third of our fleet and over 40,000 Marines globally. So thank you. How about a hand of applause for all these American, great American warriors? All right, back to my comments now. It's wonderful to be back on board the USS Harry S. Truman, CVN 75, after my last visit in March of 2022, while she was deployed in the Mediterranean Sea, and now for the Second Fleet and Joint Forces Command Norfolk Change of Command Ceremony. And that was an extraordinary visit. I flew on board her, immediately took off again, and actually went off to two other carriers, the Cavoli and our French carrier, and uh, awarded the French carrier uh, a unit commendation medal that I was so proud to have awarded them for the collaboration that we had done together previously. It shows the power of allies and partners. Uniquely, it's the one thing that I think differentiates us from them. It's the power of our allies and partners. But we are here today not just to witness a change of command, but to celebrate this legacy of service and to embrace a future of unwavering resolve amongst each other. So thank you, Vice Admiral Dwyer, for your service to our country and our Navy and for your leadership of this critical command for the past two and a half years. And Admiral Perry, the challenges that are faced by this fleet should be no stranger to you, sir. After all, you were leading operations for the U.S. Fleet Forces Command when we reestablished Second Fleet in 2018. And General Cavoli, Admiral Cottle, General Badia, Admiral Bauer, thank you again for being here today. Admiral Chris Grady, our current Vice Chair for the Joint Chiefs, then when he was U.S. Fleet Forces Commander, noted in 2018 when we reestablished Second Fleet the days of competition at sea and challenges to our maritime superiority have returned. Five and a half years ago, in August of 2018, Russia had not yet begun their second illegal war of aggression and an all-out invasion of Ukraine. The Houthis, an Iranian proxy group in Yemen, had not yet ramped up their aggressive campaign in the Red Sea in the unprecedented levels that we see today posing a major continued threat to international commercial shipping for all nations. When Vice Admiral Dwyer took command of Second Fleet in August of 2021, all of that still lay in the future. But even as we gather here this afternoon, our sailors, our ships, our aircraft, our submarines trained by Second Fleet operate up and down the eastern seaboard in the Caribbean, in the Mediterranean, and in the Red Sea. The largest instrument of American naval power and the world's most advanced aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald R. Ford, CBN-78, has been on our first operational deployment for the past eight months. Most recently, she was steaming in the eastern Mediterranean, helping ensure the conflict between Israel and Hamas does not erupt into a larger regional conflagration, which is what the Bataan Argmu is doing today. And I look forward to going aboard the Ford as she returns here to Norfolk. I won't say exactly when, but I very much look forward to going aboard her as she returns to port in celebration with all her family. It won't be the day she pulls in because I'm smarter than that. You know what I'm talking about. Another carrier trained by Second Fleet, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, 
is operating in the Red Sea as part of that same mission. Their escorts, including Hudner, Carney, Laboon, Mason, Gravely, have been protecting shipping from attacks by the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen throughout their respective deployment. These warships are successful in their missions, protecting American interests, reassuring our allies, and deterring our adversaries because of the training, the training that they received here for months, and the operational prowess that they developed here at home, led by Second Fleet. Of course, today isn't just about Second Fleet. As others have said, Joint Force Command in Norfolk is responsible for in ensuring the protection of the transatlantic link, as well as our interests in the Arctic. It is often said that JFC Norfolk represents the embodiment of transatlantic security, and I could not agree more. As the Secretary of the Navy, I can assure you that the Department of the Navy is fully committed to doing our part to support the ongoing expansion of the Joint Force Command Norfolk headquarters. As the host nation for JFC Norfolk, we are working diligently to expedite the resourcing of these new requirements and to partner with NATO to provide new facilities for JFC Norfolk as the earliest possible date. And the U.S. deeply appreciates the contributions that JFC Norfolk makes to ensuring security and prosperity across the alliance. Some may consider me as Secretary of the Navy. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Navy, but I guess I'm also the landlord down here, too. I recently went to an uh, event with the second gentleman, and he got up. Uh, we were both at the head table. He got up, and he recognized all the VIPs that were in the audience, and he referred to me as his landlord. It took me a minute to figure it out but I actually own the Washington Observatory where he has his house. He pays his rent on time, so we're okay. <laughs> NATO today is as important as it has ever been and must continue to adopt to a more dangerous world. As we've seen in Russia's brutal invasion in Ukraine, President Putin is challenging the most basic tenets of the alliance's shared values. But the borders of Europe cannot be redrawn with force that international law matters, that people and nations can make their own decisions about their future. And it is up to our Congress to pass legislation in these coming days and weeks to enable us to continue to support our Ukrainian partners in that fight. We must all reach out to our members of Congress and ensure that they do right by Ukraine and pass the supplemental so that we can continue to support those brave men and women who fight not just for their own freedom, but for the freedom of all free nations around the world. The continued development of JFC Norfolk in the face of an evolving strategic situation and continued Russian aggression is essential to underwrite the peace, the security, and prosperity that has been the hallmark of the transatlantic relationship for so many decades. So before I close, I'd like to spend just a few minutes to thank our most important guests present here today, the families of both Admiral Perry and Admiral Dwyer. The strong foundation of our families provides at home enables us as service members to go to sea with the confidence and conviction that's necessary. And it is your strength, love, determination that make us resilient, resilient enough to endure the long, difficult, and dangerous days away from home, far away from home. From the Perry family, we welcome today his three daughters, the eldest, Maddie, the middle, Ellie, who is a second-class midshipman at the United States Naval Academy, and the youngest, Georgia. Would you please stand and be recognized? Very nice. Maddie, what are you studying at the Academy? Uh, I'm studying oceanography. And what do you want to be after you graduate? Be careful. <laughs> All right, good answer, good answer. <laughs> we want to recognize his parents, Albert and Marsha. Albert, thank you for your service to our country, sir. I know that you can attest to the challenges and the rewards of command as well, too. Thank you, sir. And congratulations are still holding the record for the shortest fast attack overhaul during your time in command of USS Spadefish, SSN 68. Uh, 
If you have any tips for our current commanding officers, I'm all ears. And his in-laws, Terry and Bet. But most importantly, we must thank Joanne for her support of her husband over the past 30 plus years. I think that he would agree, and I know that my wife Betty would say the same thing of me, that he would not be here today taking command today if it were not for you and your unwavering commitment to him, your family, and the Navy. And I'm quite convinced that if you had met that other guy back then, he would be here on stage that day. <laughs> I'm just so glad it turned out the way it did. <laughs> now, from the Dwyer family, I'd like to recognize his son, Thomas, and his wife, Camille, who are expecting their first child later this year. Admiral, be ready because grandchildren change everything, you know? They do cost a lot more money, too, so. I'm going to have to keep you in the Navy for a lot longer. His daughter, Kennedy, and his wife, Peyton, as well. His youngest daughter, Rachel. And last but certainly not, uh, not least, his wife, Christina. Christina, I know that your love and support has been incredibly important to Admiral Dwyer throughout his entire career. I thank you for sharing him with our Navy and our nation and for your continued advocacy for our service members and their mental health as well, too, a role that you've played such an important role here. Our fleet is better because of your efforts. And as I often like to say, the Secretary of the Navy, you know, probably perhaps my most important legacy is to leave behind, after I'm long gone, the very best admirals and generals and senior enlisted that I can in the United States Navy. And we set nothing but the highest standards of expectations and excellence for these admirals. And Madam, he was selected because you have met all that criteria. <laughs> so, the world has indeed changed in ways that none of us could have ever suspected in the past two and a half years. And in more than 30 years of both of your careers, and it will continue to change in the near future. Preparing our fleet to operate in an uncertain world, defending American and partner interests, and our way of life is a monumental undertaking, and it simply never stops. Every ship, every submarine, every aircraft that deploys from Second Fleet leaves for the critical juncture where training meets operations. Maintaining a world-class and deployable Navy is not something that can be created overnight when crisis develops. It is the work of every leader here to ensure that our fleet and our force is ready for whatever the future brings. Like Admiral Perry, you have our full faith and confidence that you, your sailors, and our NATO partners will continue to deliver the forces needed to confront the challenges ahead of us, just as Vice Admiral Dwyer has done for the past two and a half years. All of us here today are looking forward to your success. Again, it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. May God continue to grant our nation, our allies, and our partners fair winds in following seas, and give them hell. Thank you. Vice Admiral Dwyer will now be awarded the Distinguished Service Medal by Admiral Caudill. Military guests, please stand for the presentation of the award. Military guests, attention to award. Vice Admiral Dwyer executed command and control authority over many afloat, expeditionary, and remote units to ensure sustained operational supremacy. Demonstrating strategic leadership, he worked with various NATO allies and partner nations to further international objectives and maritime diplomacy throughout the world. As commander, Combined Task Force II, he directed maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance that enabled response to the Ukraine crisis. By his distinctive accomplishments, exemplary leadership, and deep devotion to duty, Vice Admiral Dwyer reflected great credit upon himself 
and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. <laughs> Military guests, please be seated. Thank you, Secretary Del Toro, for both your presence here today and your very kind remarks. And thank you for recognizing Admiral Perry's and my family, because as you said, we wouldn't be here today without them. And thank you, Admiral Caudill, for presiding over today's ceremony and presenting me with this end of tour award. With that being said, I will now read my orders. Military guests, attention to orders. CNO Order 27892 for Vice Admiral Daniel W. Dwyer, United States Navy, detached from duty as Commander, Joint Force Command, Norfolk, Commander, United States Second Fleet, and Director, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence, and report as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfighting Development, Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. Vice Admiral Perry, I am ready to be relieved. I will now read my orders. Chief of Naval Operation Order Number 3423 for Vice Admiral D.G. Perry, United States Navy. When directed by reporting senior detached from United States Fleet Forces Command and report to Commander United States Second Fleet for duty as, as his relief as Second Fleet Commander and Director, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea Center of Excellence. Military guests, please be seated. You can now cheer. <laughs> we now transition to the Joint Force Command Norfolk portion of the ceremony. Now it is my honor to introduce the Supreme Allied Commander Europe and the commander of the U.S. European Command, General Christopher Cavoli, a distinguished Army infantry officer, a graduate of Princeton University, who as an Army officer has commanded at every level in the United States Army, and arguably during one of our nation's most challenging times where he, de where he deployed multiple times to both Iraq and Afghanistan. In his current role as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, he is responsible for all assigned NATO military forces, where today that includes over 150,000 military personnel, 125 aircraft, and 25 ships at sea, in assuring the 360-degree defense of all 1 billion NATO citizens throughout all 31 NATO countries. I had the pleasure of first serving with General Cavoli in March of 2008, when I arrived in command of Afghanistan's Kunar Province Provincial Reconstruction Team. At the time, then Lieutenant Colonel Cavoli commanded an infantry battalion in northern Kunar. And I will never forget when he called me on the phone in my very first day of command and stated his full support of my mission and said that my mission success was his success. And 15 years later, he approaches his responsibility as SACUR in the very same way, 
by ensuring the success of his commanders. So please join me in welcoming General Christopher Cavoli, Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Secretary Del Toro, Admiral Bauer, Admiral Cottle, uh, elected officials, admirals, generals, distinguished guests, uh, most of all the men and women of Joint Force Command Norfolk and Second Fleet, welcome to today's change of command ceremony for JFC Norfolk between Vice Admiral Dwyer and Vice Admiral Perry. I have prepared remarks, they're mostly about um, the JFC change of command, obviously, but if I could break from that for a moment and, and just make a couple of words about, uh, about Second Fleet. Um, first of all, to the band, thank you for being here. You're excellent. Second, to Captain Snowden, congratulations on your assumption of command of this incredible vessel, this instrument of national power. I haven't met your command master chief, but um, your sailors look splendid fit, thoughtful, committed, dedicated, disciplined, so please pass your Command Master Chief my, uh, my highest regards. Um, to the Second Fleet and to the U.S. Navy, I clearly am not a naval officer. In fact, except for my loyal aide-de-camp over there in the brown uniform and these wonderful officers who have come uh, from Europe um, to either work here or to attend this ceremony today, I feel a little bit out of my depth in this group. Um, but let me try anyway to, to express something as the commander of U.S. European Command. Th there is nothing in the world like the United States Navy. There's nothing like it. You showed that yesterday. Uh, you show it every day. Our nation depends on you, U.S. UCOM depends on you, and you deliver every single time. Admiral Cottle, would you please pass that to Admiral Franchetti? And uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I am grateful as a commander for the service that your service provides to our country. God bless you all for that. This is my speech. I have been handed my speech and now I can continue. <laughs> Wait, this isn't my speech. No, I'm just teasing, I'm teasing. <clears throat> I think there's another copy of it here. Um, so what we're doing here today though is not simply a change of command ceremony. It's more than a simple handover between commanders. This is really a ceremony that speaks to the very heart of NATO's mission of collective defense because when leadership changes, our goals and our principles do not. This is about continuity. Our strategic direction and our operational readiness remain rock steady always, especially during transitions like today's. So Vice Admiral Dwyer assumed command in August of 2021 with the task of preparing GFC Norfolk for its new role in the Alliance's modernized collective descent system. The task was not and has not been easy. He took command during a global pandemic. JFC Norfolk was minimally manned, under-resourced for its tasks. But Vice Admiral Dwyer's leadership provided a calm, steady hand during the uncertainty of that pandemic and during the effort to transform the headquarters into the full-scale warfighting command that NATO needs in the high north ever since Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Under Dozer's leadership, JFC Norfolk built strong relationships with our allies in the high north. He personally played a pivotal role in integrating Finland into the alliance, and he has set the standard for integrating Sweden in the nearest future. Admiral Dwyer was also hard at work here in Norfolk. He set the foundation for this headquarters to grow fit for its new purpose, tirelessly establishing procedures, conducting organizational change, finding infrastructure and vital equipment. He single-handedly brought this command up to a point where it will soon be ready to assume its rightful and much larger role in the northern reaches of the battle space of Allied Command 
operations. I could go on and on, but there is just one simple message under all of my words. Vice Admiral Dozer Dwyer was the right leader for this command at the right time to guide JFC Norfolk at a vital period for all of us. Dozer, we're grateful for that leadership. We're grateful for your leadership. Our alliance is stronger because of what you have accomplished here with this remarkable organization. As uh, Secretary Del Toro noted, however, nobody does something like this all by himself. Um, so we also celebrate the presence here today of Dozer's lovely wife, Christina, his mother, Terry, sister, Barbara, son, Thomas, daughter, Kennedy, and her wife, Peyton, his daughter, Rachel. Guys, your support has been critical to our mission, and we are grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be sorry to see you go, but the Navy will be better for it as you move on to the Navy staff, Dozer. Um, so that's the bitter part. Changes of command are bittersweet. The sweet part is that today we welcome the new commander of JFC Norfolk, Vice Admiral Douglas Perry. Doug's got everything we need. He's a submarine officer with unmatched operational experience. He served aboard the USS Pittsburgh, the NR-1, the USS Maine. He's commanded the Pasadena. He's commanded Submarine Development Squadron 5, Submarine Group 9. He's done so much work on submarines, in fact, that apparently he just couldn't stay aboard. He's also served underway as a Navy diver, which is fantastic. Doug comes to us from the Navy staff where he was, no surprise, the Director of Undersea Warfare Division. Considering what JFC Norfolk has to do in the Atlantic, I just can't think of a better officer, Doug, to take the helm of this command at this exciting and essential time. And we welcome as well today the entire Perry family. Vice Admiral Perry's wife, Joanne, is here, along with their lovely daughters, Maddie, Ellie, and Gigi. Doug's father, Al, is here. You won't be surprised to discover that he is a retired submarine commander. Doug's mom, Marsha, is here, and his sisters, Ann, Sarah, and Catherine, and so are his brothers, David and Ken, himself a retired Rear Admiral, and Bob's out there someplace in the ether, I believe, watching. Welcome to you all, and congratulations. You share in this great day, uh, just as Doug does, and just as we do. Doug, you inherit a command that is at the forefront of NATO's strategic operations. There just couldn't be a more important time than this. The events of the past two years in Europe have jolted us awake and the gravity of our task to defend not only our own nation but to defend collectively all of our nations against a threat that is obvious and active and truly menacing there could be no higher calling more than a billion citizens of our alliance depend on us i know you are the right officer to take this on our alliance, ladies and gentlemen, this alliance that is set on a bedrock of values and is built up by the professionalism and dedication of the militaries of 31 like-minded nations, this alliance, our alliance, remains the cornerstone of global security. It is vital, not only for us, but for humanity. It is the strongest and most successful alliance in the history of mankind and may we always be worthy of its mission. May God bless you all and your servicemen and women. May God bless the United States of America and the United States Navy. And may God continue to bless our wonderful alliance. Thank you all so much. General Cavo. General Cavoli will now preside over the transfer of responsibility and authority for Joint Force Command Norfolk. Symbolized by the passing of the Joint Force Command Norfolk flag from Command Sergeant Major Simonson to Vice Admiral Dwyer, who will pass the flag to General Cavoli, who then passes the flag to Vice Admiral Perry. Military guests, attention to ceremony.
Military guest, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Dwyer. Okay. Wow. Thank you, General Cavoli, for your very kind remarks. There's a lot going on in the world today, and especially in Europe. And for you to be here today in person means a lot to me personally, but to all the men and women of Joint Force Command Norfolk. Your presence here really shows that what we do matters. And we are all internally grateful for you being here with us today, sir. So thank you very much. Well, welcome again to you all. Ceremonies like this do not happen by themselves, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank Ms. Brooke Mann, the protocol officer of JFC Norfolk and U.S. Second Fleet, as well as the supporting cast of professionals from both mentioned commands, as well as U.S. Fleet Forces Command, Allied Command Transformation, and the USS Harry S. Truman. An incredible job executed under a month's time across the holiday season. This has been an incredible time, and I'm so proud of all you have done. It has been my honor to have served as the commander of JFC Norfolk and the U.S. Second Fleet and the director of the Combined Joint Operations from the Sea Center of Excellence. First, thank you, Secretary Del Toro. Mr. Secretary, I meant what I said during my introduction. You have been an incredible supporter of the fleet and NATO. In my personal top 10 experiences during this tour, you figured prominently in three of them, which include Fleet Week New York. If you ever go to Fleet Week New York, go as the Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable <laughs> Carlos Del Toro. Growing up in Hell's Kitchen, it was a great time, Mr. Secretary. I look forward to the next time. Don't need to tell any more stories, I'll end it that. And two separate carrier landings on Gerald R. Ford and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Now, I've never seen anyone more excited about a cod landing on a carrier than Secretary Del Toro. And at the time, we were escorting the Prime Minister of Norway on to Ford and the President of Finland to Eisenhower. And that was cool, but it was evident that the cooler part was getting the carrier landing. So, Mr. Secretary, it was a lot of fun. And uh, no doubt of your commitment to the Navy and the NATO Alliance. And I'm, I'm tremendously honored that you can be here today. So, thank you, sir. And I'd also like to thank Admiral Cottle. He's an incredible leader, an incredible mentor, and friend to Christina and myself. Your span of responsibility is immense. You handle it with such enthusiasm and passion, always allowing your commanders to lead. And it's evident when we connect with your staff that they're all in on our success because of your leadership. You're the smartest person in the room without a doubt, but your humility always hears out your commander's advice. We always go with what you say, but you hear us out, sir, so thank you very much. You're a true warrior, without a doubt, and someone that I count is one of my very close friends, so thank you, Admiral, for being here. General Cavoli, you've also been an incredible leader, and your span of responsibility is equally immense as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander and the U.S.'s Commander for U.S. European Command. And as, the person who, and as the person who is solely responsible to you for 80% of your NATO area responsibility, your direction, guidance, and priorities were always clear and understood. And you two always backed up my decisions, just like you have done for all your commanders. And during this incredible transformation of JFC Norfolk, you have been our strongest advocate, and your support to the men and women of JFC Norfolk is sincerely appreciated. You two are a true warrior who, have been, who I've been incredibly honored 
to serve under. So thank you, General. The accolades, the commendations, the successes heard here today are a result of the incredible support and teamwork I have enjoyed during this tour. And there are so many to thank, so please bear with me. The dedicated team that enabled me to focus and prioritize across the three commands effectively is undoubtedly my front office team, starting with three chiefs of staff, first with Yank Cummings, then Rocco Batera, now J.J. Johnson, today's MC, and the executive and deputy executive assistants, Chris Cummings and now Aaron Arkey, Paul Ingram and, and now Amanda Buck. And then there are the military aides. On the second fleet side, first Andrew Farring, then Eli Sinai and now Ben Gilly. And on the JFC side, Christian Meister and now Michael Radke, both from the German Navy and Flag Secretary, the talented Commander Lavidia McDaniel, Flag Rider, Yeoman Chief Petty Officer James Coe, who has now been with me for three flag tours, and I'm glad you have energy for one more, Chief. An unmatched in culinary talent, Culinary Specialist Senior Chief Gary Askins, who served as enlisted aide. An incredible team from a diverse, warfighting backgrounds and nationalities. There never was a time that they were not in alignment and always ensured I was prepared and had everything I needed to represent the mission and the objectives of each command. And you each have my sincere appreciation. I also was a beneficiary of tremendous support from new, numerous U.S. and NATO commands, starting with the NATO Military Committee and its chair, Admiral Rob Bauer. Sir, we met during my first week of command and you have been an incredible supporter and advocate of JFC Norfolk's transformation. And we too have had several memorable experiences, and I truly appreciate you attending here today, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, General Philip Levine, who could not be here with us today, but is represented by the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, General Chris Padilla, ACT, our neighbors at NSA Hampton Roads, has shown us nothing but the utmost support to JFC Norfolk's mission. Whatever support we needed, they answered without question or hesitation. General Levine and Badia, both fighter pilots and both great friends of Christina and me, please accept my sincere appreciation for your support. And there are many partners of JFC Norfolk and, and the U.S. Second Fleet represented here today. The, all the ACO components, National Joint Headquarters, PGHQ, Norwegian Joint Headquarters, Joint Arctic Command, the U.S. Commands of the U.S. Coast Guard Area Command, U.S. Marine Forces Command, and the 2nd MEF. JSC Norfolk and U.S. Second Fleet's ability to meet our mission objectives are only because of the strong support of your commands. So please accept my sincere thanks and appreciation. And here in Norfolk, the incredible men and women that I have been honored to serve with, first not here with us today, I must thank Vice Admiral Woody Lewis, the first commander of U.S. Second Fleet when it was reestablished in JFC Norfolk. In August 2021, Woody turned over three commands with a strong foundation to build upon. Woody was the right leader at the right time, and he has my thanks. NATO's combined joint operations from the Sea Center of Excellence is made possible through the contributions of both personnel and funding by 13 NATO nations to drive NATO warfighting development by exploring maritime interoperability and multi-domain integration through new innovative concepts and capabilities. It has been my honor to be a part of this incredible team with an incredible Deputy Director, Commodore Phil Nash of the Royal Navy, and branch heads, Captain Roy McClay from the Canadian Navy and Giuseppe Capitano from the Italian Navy. Thank you to the entire CJOS team for your dedication to shape and advance our thinking in the maritime. I'm also eternally grateful to the men and women of Joint Force Command Norfolk. JFC Norfolk was first envisioned as a small crisis planning cell in Norfolk, Virginia. It has undergone a rapid transformation during my time in command not only in response to Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, 
but the Alliance's return to its core mandate of collective defense. JFC Norfolk has been on a journey over the last 18 months to define what attributes and functions are required to face this new security environment. Through hard work by some incredible flag officers like Rear Admirals Tim Henry from the Royal Navy, Ignacio Suspedes from the Spanish Navy, and Frederick de Rupoli from the French Navy, and Commodore Stale Peterson from the Norwegian Navy, and Steen Peterson from the Danish Navy, and I mustn't forget our Icelandic political officer, Ms. Ms. Jona Solveig Elendorter. Each worked tirelessly across the Atlantic to define not only the requirements needed to conduct coordinated operations in peacetime, but also ensuring JFC Norfolk is ready for conflict today. And I'm proud to say their work has resulted in the first comprehensive regional plan that addresses our response to crisis and conflict, and most importantly, the North Atlantic Council's approval for full transition to the NATO command structure on 1 January of this year, as well as an approved significant uplift in personnel. JFC Cor Norfolk's core mission is to secure the transatlantic link and ensure the resupply and reinforcement of Europe is assured, while defending every inch of NATO territory in our assigned area of responsibility. And the work done by each member of this incredible team has done just that, and in doing so, provided for the collective defense of one billion NATO citizens. And I'm incredibly proud to have served along each and every one of you. And I wish you nothing but the success going forward. Second Fleet's mission is to command and control mission-ready forces to deter and, when ordered, defeat our nation's enemy while defending the maritime avenues of approach between North America and Europe while strengthening our ability to operate with allies and partners. During my time at the helm, the men and women have responded and proven their ability to execute the mission and live up to the Second Fleet motto, ready to fight. I have been supported by an all-star team of our navies and our allies' very best. Second Fleet is the only fleet with an allied vice commander from the Canadian Navy. And I've had the honor of serving with two vice commanders during my tour. First, Rear Admiral Steve Waddell, who is now the VCNO of the Canadian Navy, and current vice commander, David Patchell, two incredible and experienced officers, Canada's very best. I've also had two outstanding deputy commanders, first Rear Admiral Brian Davies, and now Rear Admiral Marty Muckian. While both served as Second Fleet Deputy Commander, they had additional responsibilities as Commander of Submarine Group 2, overseeing the employment of all Eastern Atlantic submarine operations. Both talented and impeccable flag officers who drove my priorities to ensure the Second Fleet was ready to fight. Second Fleet also benefited from the leadership of two exceptional Vice Commanders from the U.S. Naval Reserve. Rear Admirals Will Angerman and Brian Smith, who are exceptional in the effortlessly supporting Second Fleet operations and advising how to best utilize the fleet's robust reserve force commanded by Bob Gerstmeyer. And making it all happen in the Second Fleet, Assistant Chiefs of Staff and Special Assistants with Captain Holly Yaditsky as a Director of the Maritime Operations Center and the other ACOSs and Special Assistants you see listed in your programs. And then I was fortunate to have two great Fleet Master Chiefs, First Fleet Master Chief Huben Phillips and now Fleet Master Chief Jason Avin. The right Master Chiefs at the right time to make a difference. I've had so many moments of pride watching this cadre operate as a cohesive and steady team. From certifying and deploying five carrier strike groups and two amphibious ready groups for either scheduled deployments or in response to crisis across the globe. When the headline was the Secretary of Defense had ordered naval forces to respond to a given crisis, it was the Second Fleet who deployed those forces. The first deployment of the Gerald R. Ford Strike Group, one year ahead of schedule, was the result of the hard work of the men and women of the Second Fleet. And when the order was given to bring down a high-altitude balloon off the East Coast, it was the men and women of the Second Fleet who was in command of the recovery effort. 
arguably my proudest moment for this team, began in the days leading up to the Ukraine invasion when the Second Fleet was ordered to go forward and command naval forces in the European area of operations in order to deter Russian naval forces and demonstrate our nation's support of our allies and partners. During this time, the men and women of Second Fleet flawlessly executed those operations for 90 continuous days, working for the commander of Naval Forces Europe, operating on the European time zone, while concurrently maintaining Second Fleet operations. Yes, working for two four-star bosses six hours apart. The men and women of Second Fleet, no matter the mission, answered all bells and achieved the mission success every time. In this new security environment, during this time of strategic competition, Second Fleet demonstrated it was ready to fight, and I am incredibly proud to serve alongside each and every one of you. I'm also deeply indebted to the support from so many mentors and shipmates, officers who I hold in the highest regard by their example, whose advice and support has been to my benefit. Some are here with us today. Admiral Jamie Fogo, Vice Admiral Bullet Miller, Vice Admiral Kenny Weitzel, I'm so thankful for your support and your attendance today. I also equal gratitude to several flag officers. My, one of my strike group commanders, Nosal, Admiral Chris Ocalino, Admiral Chris Grady, and my good friend, Admiral Sam Paparo, our Vice Chief Jim Kilby, and our CNO Lisa Franchetti. I truly appreciate their friendship and their support. And then there's the Dillingham crowd. Captain Dillingham, where is he, Admiral Sarada? Did he make it? He's standing in the watch. And to the Dillingham crowd, appreciate your support these last two years. Then there are the friends and squadron mates, Miggs, Dog, Omar, Abdul, Blue Lou, and Puck, all here today and every day to keep me grounded and clear-headed on what matters. And there through and through is my family. Here today, my mom, Terry, my sister, Barbara, my nephew, Matt, my cousin, Dan and Chris, and the pride of a truly blessed father, my kids, Thomas, Kennedy, Rachel, and daughters-in-law, Peyton and Camille, each with more talent, intelligence, and wisdom than I will ever have, and each with successful careers. I'm so proud of you all, each and every day. And also here are my son's in-laws, Tom and Denise Holden, who have been so supportive of Christina and me during this tour. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. And finally, to my bride of 31 years. She told me not to read anything, but to read what she has written instead. <laughs> my wife asked me to use this time. I would have spoken about her feelings for you, our guest, to the JFC, C. Joss, and Second Fleet staff and spouses, is my mixture of gratitude and sadness that I say goodbye to this incredible community. It has been a pleasure getting to know you and your families over these past two and a half years. There have been so many wonderful times shared together, and I will never forget you. To my Dillingham group, we have built something very special. There has been a lot of laughter and a bit of sadness but it has, been brought, it has brought us closer together in a way military spouses could only hope for. Thank you for being such a big part of this chapter in our lives, and I hope the memories we have made will be a reminder of the strength found in unity and friendship. We will miss you all tremendously, Christina. You said it better than I could have, but I'm not going to let you off the hook. 31 years. Thank you, Christina. You know, I did forget her once in a change of command speech. I did forget to thank her. I won't do that ever again. Thank you. Couldn't have done it without you. I love you very much. And to the new commander of JFC Norfolk, 2nd Fleet and Siege Off COE, Doug, you are an exemplary naval officer and proven warfighter. You will take these three commands to new heights and in that journey, I wish you every success. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention, your attendance, and I am so incredibly honored by your presence. May God bless each of you, our great Navy, all NATO allies, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Perry, Commander, Joint Force Command Norfolk, Commander, United States Second Fleet, Director, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Vice Admiral Dwyer, Dozer, a thank you for a phenomenal turnover. I'm indebted to you for setting the conditions for continued growth and success. We're on the right trajectory, and I really appreciate everything. Moreover, Joanne and I really appreciate getting to know you and Christina. You were warm to us. You welcomed us in, and uh, that has meant the world to us. Thank you very, very much. Secretary Del Toro, it is an honor to share the stage with you once again. Uh, thank you for your continued efforts to improve the quality of service for our sailors and Marines. It makes a difference. Admiral Bauer, your presence here highlights the significance to NATO and the profound military capabilities the United States delivers to the NATO alliance, providing NATO security across all domains, not just in the maritime, in service to 31 nations. There is no better place, no better place than to have this change of command than on board a Nimitz class carrier in NATO's only home port in the United States in North America. Great to have you here. General Cavoli and Admiral Caudill, thank you for your leadership at such a consequential time that we have spoken of here this morning. I'm eager to lead my teams for each of you to achieve your priorities in the Atlantic and then the Arctic and in Europe. Lieutenant General Badia, I look forward to working with you and, and General Levine. Thank you for your support from SAC-T. To our other distinguished NATO leaders, deputy commanders from our fellow Joint Force Commands in Brunson and Naples, and the deputy commanders from the Theater Component Commands, I am eager to serve alongside you with my great staffs to preserve our defensive alliance and secure the transatlantic link between North America and Europe. To my fellow U.S. Navy flag officers who are here today, I'm honored to be amongst this group of warfighters once again in Norfolk. I am ready to learn. My sea bag is packed. I did, I did know how to get to the captain's in-port cabin this morning just for all the, the carry aviators. But I'm proud to be your running mate, and I'm ready to learn. To my senior enlisted leader at JFC Norfolk, Command Sergeant Major Christian Simonson, and our Second Fleet Command Master Chief Jason Avon, thank you for leading and inspiring our joint forces in uniform every day. I am confident we will achieve great things together. To Brookman, our Second Fleet Protocol Officer, and everyone who supported the change of command today, I owe you all a huge debt of gratitude and kudos for a spectacular event. Thank you very much. I'm privileged to be joined here today by so many significant leaders. Those of us who have served know that to execute our global missions as part of a joint force with allies and partners to defend freedom, that requires a lot of hard work. It requires cooperation, humility, and determination, which all leads to trust. The trust that we build cultivating essential personal and command relationships, well, that is what enables us to become the ready and the responsive force that our nation and the NATO alliance need. Trust empowers our international military partnerships, and trust underpins our collective warfighting readiness. Our ability to trust teams far forward, as discussed here, under mission command is what distinguishes us from our strategic competitors. They do not have the partners that we have. There are many people here today and not here who have trusted me, enabled me to grow throughout my career. First among them is my wife, Joanne. And I'm so grateful to you, Joanne, for supporting me throughout this career and an example to all the military spouses and families who support their uniform service members, not just in the United States Navy, but in our NATO teams as well. They live here in Norfolk now, so 
A thanks now to our military spouses and families. I love you, Joe. Maddie, Ellie, and Gigi, watching you grow up into strong, capable women, that is my greatest joy. Your mom and I are incredibly proud of you, and we are so grateful for you. Mom and Dad, I'm blessed that I had to look no further from you and your exemplary life of service to understand what I was capable of and what I needed to do. I am blessed to be back here in Norfolk where my brother and sister and I all grew up as kids. I had my first job delivering the, Vig the Virginian pilot here in Ghent. I'm blessed to have Ken, Ann, Bob, Dave, Sarah, and Catherine. Each of you have inspired me to lead. I love you all and thank you for being here to share the moment. And there are some shipmates here in the audience from every command in my career. From USS Pittsburgh, Steve Wolf, my first commanding officer, Submarine NR1, USS Maine, Pasadena, Devron 5, Group 9, and from OPNAV N97. I'm here because you all had confidence and you trusted me. Several specific mentors I'd like to mention, in addition to my first CO, Steve Wolf, some Vice Admirals, Malloy, Mers, to follow, and Van Buskirk, my, my most recent boss, Admiral Caudill. Back all the way back to Squadron 3. Thanks very much, sir. And there are some close friends, not necessarily in, connected to the Navy, from as far back as Fort Hunt High School and as recently as Bainbridge Island and uh, courses at the Harvard and Leadership at the Peak. But most and first among them are my classmates from the class of 89. Yeah. So the 10th company players and a good number of submariners are amongst that group. I grew up inside the yard in Annapolis with them. They taught me eventually to be a reliable shipmate. And in the submarine nuclear pipeline, I learned what technical competence was about and took that lesson to sea with me for 30 years. Your support and encouragement has meant the world to me, and I love you all. So to our civic leaders and the out-of-town guests, you may have wondered why you got this invitation, at least the one's for me. You've seen some pomp and circumstance here today during the ceremony, but the real showcase here today is our servicemen and women in the joint services from 31 NATO nations to include thousands of talented sailors here aboard Harry S. Truman. They enlisted and commissioned from across the United States and from around the world. And they represent just a fraction of the more than two million service members who serve abroad at, and at home to defend the freedoms we enjoy. Take a moment to talk to these men and women, learn about their expertise operating the most advanced systems on planet Earth and their stories of service. Take those stories back to your communities, please. Help our communities understand what we do and the value of our service. That story could begin with a great Virginian who served in uniform and then as our first president. General George Washington, in 1781, speaking to his first ally, wrote to Marquis de Lafayette, it follows then as certain as that night succeeds the day, that without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive. But with it, everything honorable and glorious. Well, that was 200, 243 years ago today, and even more so today. Because today's alignment of Joint Force Command Norfolk with Second Fleet demonstrates our American resolve for a joint's Second Fleet Naval Headquarters with NATO strength and values. Now, this year, celebrates NATO's 75th anniversary. And given the ongoing, ongoing global security situation, the relevance of NATO has never been more important. NATO started with just 12 member states, and now there are 31, soon to be 32. This is a testament to the longevity and strength of the alliance. So as Joint Force Command Norfolk, I'm responsible to General Cavoli Sakir for the cooperation and coordination of allied activity in the Atlantic and the Arctic. And with Second Fleet, where I am ready to command ready mission, for ready mission forces to deter and defeat potential adversaries, we are on the right path. And Dozer, it is you who built upon Woody Lewis's efforts 
efforts, and you charted the way with this group, these great staffs for Second Fleet and JFC Norfolk and CJOS COE. I'm committed to that plan that you put in place, and the headquarters staffs are now well postured to execute it. So ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to become your commander today. I look forward to what we can accomplish together. May God bless and watch over our sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines in harm's way, and may God bless the United States, our allies and partners. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the benediction and departure of the official party. Let us pray. Listen, post the side boys. Military guests, please cover. Navy, departing. Supreme, Allied Commander Europe, departing. Fleet forces departing. Vice Admiral, United States Navy departing. Joint Force Command Norfolk, United States Second Fleet, Combined Joint Operations from the Sea, Center of Excellence, departing. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony.